This conversation is brought to you by the Eco Stewards Program. My name is Vicki Machado and I'm a, a leader on, their, on the leadership team there. We're a creative community that inspires, shapes, and connects young adult leaders through storytelling and place-based pilgrimages that focus on faith in the environment. Each summer we convene in a different watershed and we'll listen to people of faith as they navigate local social and environmental issues. Um, this has allowed us to talk with so many different people. We've spoken with elders on the Crow Reservation in Montana, um, Quakers who are protesting at, at Occupy Boston, and more recently, just a few years ago, we talked with Hawaiian taro farmers in Kailua. A year ago, the Eco Stewards leadership team decided we wanted to dedicate the next few years to exploring the intersection of faith and climate justice. And we had to postpone this year's Northern California trip due to the pandemic, but we wanted to continue these discussions in other creative ways. So this evening's conversation aligns more with the kind of dialogues that you would hear during our typical Eco Stewards gathering. So when we consider communities and relationships that are often overlooked when we talk about climate justice, um, we are, we're not really talking about incarcerated populations. And I think that's uh, a really important part of this, of this dialogue. So with that, we are honored to have Katerina and Stephen here from Insight Garden Program to tell you about their work and the intersection of justice, faith, and nature and what that looks like to them. And before, uh, before we jump into that, I would like Rob to just say a few words um, and, and then we'll kick it off. Thank you, Vicki. I'm Rob Mark. I have the honor of also serving along with Vicki and some amazing other people with this Eco Stewards program. And uh, it's such an honor to have Katerina and, and all of you today and Stephen with us tonight. Um, we all are coming from different watersheds tonight. And one of the things we like to always acknowledge as an eco stewards program that try to connect, our, connect ourselves, the reality of the land is to recognize the watershed in which we are. So tonight, I just wanna take a moment to recognize the land in which each of us are, um, standing, sitting, occupying, breathing in and receiving from the gift of that earth. Uh, I want us to recognize the first nations and the first people of those places. Uh, may it be Crow or Nottaway, or for me, the Mattachusett here in Massachusetts. We're not gonna have the time to go around and name all of those, and I'm sorry for that, uh, but I know that and I trust our spirits are connected, and I just wanna open a moment of silence to recognize if you know the name of people who have walked the lands before you, uh, name that in your heart right now. If you don't, commit yourself to becoming more aware uh, of those names and places and people, um, and also maybe keep in mind those who will walk in these landscapes after us, God willing. Uh, so just, I, I open this moment of silence, of gratitude, uh, and acknowledgement of the land, and particularly maybe a focus in on California and the fires, climate-induced, that we hold in our hearts right now, as Vicki has said. I'm um, sharing tonight from um, Fresno, California, the land, traditional homelands of Yokuts people. So thank you for that invitation, Rob, to remember the peoples of our place. The closest river to me is the San Joaquin River in the Tulare Buena Vista Lakes watershed. And um, COVID has provided an opportunity to connect with our local places more. And um, I, I just wanted to, share um, that I'm holding in my heart, and I'm sure Stephen is as well, so many people right now who are inside prison on lockdown since March because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and now also breathing in the air of these wildfires here in California. So as we breathe tonight, we remember them and offer our prayers for them um, incarcerated right now. Um, I wanted to just start out by way of introduction with some words about myself, and then I'll turn it over to Stephen to share um, to share an introduction as well. I'm the program, a program manager with Insight Garden Program. Um, we're in 11 state prisons in California and I work in two of them, Central California Women's Facility and Avenal State Prison. And I'm also a Mennonite pastor and educator. Um, what really grounds me and motivates me is creating what uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and others have called the beloved community. Um, and to me that 
represents a community of belonging um, where we realize our interconnections with one another and also with the earth. Um, and I met Stephen inside Avenal State Prison, creating uh, one of those places of beloved community together um, in Insight Garden program inside the prison there and was just struck with Stephen's um, depth of thought and, and wisdom and character and um, had hoped to reconnect on the outside and it turns out he was released to the Central Valley here in California nearby so our reentry team has been able to meet up with him twice now and to be in good connection with him since he got out um, I want to say in March, right, right, Stephen? Just as COVID was taking off. Was was taking off? Yeah, it was like a uh, late, late February. Late but, February. Yeah. yeah. So I'll turn it over to Stephen to just share a little bit about himself and his story before I share more about our program. Well, my name is Stephen Medina. Um, I was a participant at the Inside Gardening Program in Avenal State Prison in the Central Valley, and uh, a little about myself. Um, I've been incarcerated for most of my young adult life. Um, and, uh, this was my second, about my second, uh, time in prison and, uh, really had no hopes of, uh, of any kind of future until I decided to, uh, pretty much change my life with programs and, you know, just reading a lot more and, and starting to kind of come into my faith a little bit. But, um, while in the inside gardening program, uh, that's where I met, uh, Kat and, uh, a couple of other uh, volunteers. And uh, pretty much it, 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 it opened up a lot of new, new ways of thinking and new, new thoughts, you know, um, new ideas, uh, not only about uh, like personal growth, but about the community and um, just um, the natural world itself too. So Stephen and I just wanted to share a little bit about what, it's, what our program does. And so I'll share kind of our big picture overview and then turn it over to Stephen to share what it's like in the classroom and the impact that IGP had on him. Um, so this is just a picture of our uh, opening meditation at Avenal State Prison. We like to start our classes with um, mindfulness practice and meditation. Um, and sunflowers are one of the few flowers that really take off there because Avenal gets up to what, like 113, Stephen? It's, it gets out there. Yeah, out there in the desert, uh, kind of north of Bakersfield um, towards the coastal range. The mission of Insight Garden Program is um, to, to really reconnect people with themselves, their communities, and with the natural world. And we do that by using gardening as this tool of healing um, to really be a restorative link between people and nature. Um, and then also to get this sense of how they're part of a much bigger, much bigger systems beyond the individual. Um, prison can be so isolating and what we try to do is bring in a whole different um, way of thinking and being that's based on reconnection and our interconnections with all life from the smallest butterflies that go and pollinate the flowers inside the prison um, to the bigger systems like our food system which we talk about in our classes and we really see our approach of this inner gardening which involves inner work on oneself as well as outer gardening which involves permaculture training and hands-on gardening in prisons as a, as a way to um, transform people's lives, not only those in prison, but also on the outside as people in prison are so connected with all of our families and communities um, to ultimately end ongoing cycles of incarceration and create more healthy and safe communities. Um, we're in, like I mentioned, 11 prisons in California. So the Avenal prison that we're focusing on is just one of many and one yard um, of many that we're involved with. Um, we're also in Indiana and in Ohio at some different facilities there. Um, and we've kept expanding since we started about 18 years ago at San Quentin State Prison in California. And, um, really started out as more of a therapeutic program, gardening program, and have come to see ourselves as more um, at the intersection of environmental justice and criminal justice, and working more at a systems level um, as we really see the impact of these deeper systems of incarceration um, and their connection with racism and um, and classism and, and really um, trying to create alternative models for, restor for justice and restoration kind of within the shell of the old, um, creating something new 
within um, by engaging in positive programming and ways that people can work at transformation, um, but also transforming the systems themselves. So, so some of how we do that is um, at, at the very kind of core self level is reconnecting with self involves meditation, emotional processing work, um, what some of our curriculum, which is a year long curriculum deals with um, really letting the masks come down, feeling our emotions coming into, into touch with our bodies. Um, working on communication skills, conflict resolution is part of that family systems work. And what we find is when we bring in volunteers from the outside, they often say, wow, why don't we learn this in schools? Like we've never learned this. <laughs> so oftentimes people from the outside are coming in and we're also being educated and transformed. So it's not a one directional street. We're really trying to create a community where where we learn some of these ways of being human together that are healthier and, um, and more respectful towards one another in the natural world. Um, so we're building community in that process. Um, we really see that in the prison gardens, it, especially in prisons that, um, uh, that operate more according to what they call prison politics, that people are able to kind of let their guard down a little bit and cross racial lines or cross, um, cross lines that they wouldn't cross out on the rest of the prison, that in the garden they can actually feel safe to work together and to cooperate as a team um, effort in that work. So building community and then also bringing in outside volunteers into places that can, like I said, feel isolated, especially for people who don't get a lot of family visits. And this is particularly true, um, I see this at the women's prison where Oftentimes women will visit um, male family members who are incarcerated, but women themselves um, sometimes don't get as many visits from or support from family or loved ones. Um, so building that community with outside volunteers, with people on the inside of prison, and then also with the natural world where uh, we use permaculture and hands-on gardening skills training um, to really draw our connections and to see the ways that um, that we're all ecologically part of a bigger whole where what we do um, affects so many of others around us, um, whether that's um, plants or the soil, uh, what we eat, how we dispose our waste, how we build our homes, um, what we plant, um, has so many ripple effects in the natural world. Um, and then we kind of draw that out as a metaphor in our own lives. What are we composting in our lives? What do we want to plant and leave for the next generation? Um, how are we pruning out things that no longer serve us? Um, so really using that garden as a metaphor for growth and transformation. And in our classroom, this is just a really broad and quick overview, but you can see our website for more details. Uh, we go through these four arcs of learning that are about 12 week cycles. Um, and go through about a year. And it, that involves um, environmental education in our first arc, um, where we actually, one of our, one of our uh, actually two of our lessons in there deal with climate change. And we're really bringing in more, um, more exercises and activities to teach climate justice and to prepare people to be leaders and um, educators in their own home communities around climate change environmental education from everything from food systems to ecological principles. Um, and then we move into the garden where um, people inside prison get the opportunity to design and build a garden within the prison walls. And this is no easy feat to bring in wheelbarrows and shovels and have pruners and lockers and you know um, on hand in a, especially in higher security prisons. So, um, we've been able to plant uh, gardens in all the prisons where we work. Um, some of them more challenging than others. Like I mentioned, the heat at Avenal makes it a little difficult. Um, but we use permaculture, which is really a design philosophy that, um, that really looks at how can we work with nature rather than against nature in how we plan um, human habitations, including gardens and houses and um, human systems that can cooperate with nature and work with work with how mother nature thinks and works. Um, so they get to design and then build a garden inside prison and then learn how to maintain that garden. Um, arc three moves into those gardening metaphors that I talked about and works around our inner gardens. Um, they, they do a personal garden plan and actually we've been 
doing that ourselves as volunteers and facilitators now too of um, what are we wanting to plant and harvest in our own inner garden as we learn these skills of emotional intelligence and community group work together. And then finally, our fourth arc is re-entry preparation. And for, for those who will enter society, we work with a lot of lifers too. So some of them um, will not be re-entering society anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, and so that's crafted around leadership growth and what do they want to cultivate in terms of um, vocation and mission and values um, within prison as well as within their home communities and families. Um, and uh, we've been having more of an environmental justice focus, especially around green jobs, bringing in outside speakers and guests to prepare people for, um, for job opportunities outside. And I believe on this call, uh, Angelica um, Castellano is, uh, let's see, Costilla is on this call, um, who is our reentry coordinator and um, has just been an amazing um, team leader as we prepare people for re-entry, a big part of our work has been, um, has been actually working with people uh, once they're released to reconnect them with job opportunities in their communities and housing and emotional support. Um, so now I just wanted to share a couple pictures from our garden and, um, and Stephen and I can share a little bit about what the program looks like day to day. But um, this is our, our garden, it's in a flower design. This is probably half, uh, maybe a third of our garden at Avenal State Prison on one of the yards when we first started it. It's grown a lot since then. But uh, the soil there has uh, contamination from valley fever. So we actually couldn't dig in the soil because of these spores in the soil. So we had to come up with creative ways to build a garden in these uh, containers above ground. Um, a muralist came in from the outside and worked with our class and others to create this exquisite mural of pollinators and native California plants at the prison. So some of you might recognize the hummingbird, the monarch butterfly. There's a hummingbird sage and bees there. And there's Stephen in the very back, the tallest guy with the hat <laughs> in our class there in prison. Um, I work with um, Arnold Trevino, who's pictured in the center, is another facilitator with me, and he was actually incarcerated for 25 years. He's a former lifer, and you can see him there in his graduation garb because he just graduated uh, two years ago from Avenal State Prison. Um, or sorry, he, he was incarcerated at Avenal State Prison for part of his time, and he just graduated from Fresno State University with a master's degree in social work. So many of these former lifers and people coming out of prison have so many gifts to offer and a lot of potential to offer the community. And Arnold's really a trailblazer in that regard. And I'm really privileged to have him as a fellow facilitator um, at Avenal to just share his own story and, um, and really relate to people from the experience of, of somebody who's been incarcerated and has really broken through a lot of barriers for folks on the outside of prison. Here we are um, working with some marigolds and uh, this is on another yard at Avenal where we started a garden more recently and they were able to, well, for the garden nerds out there, they were able to work with the soil by um, doing some sheet mulching and put down cardboard, straw, compost, coffee grounds, comfrey leaves, um, to kind of um, building up the soil rather than digging into it, which I love that approach. Um, and have been planting a lot of California native plants because they're some of the only ones that really survive and thrive in such harsh conditions at Avenal. Different kinds of sages, um, different kinds of uh, grasses and California natives, as well as some herbs and hardy perennials, um, succulents, aloe vera, that kind of thing. And I'll just flash you some pictures. We're not focusing on the women's facility today, but um, this is one of my favorite gardens actually because they gave us a huge amount of space. We have over 7,000 square feet to work with. Um, and they created a healing garden with a kind of um, four corners of the medicine wheel and the cross brought together in this healing center design here of um, rainbow patterns and a huge circle design that you can see them building it. Um, we were able to bring in some raised beds um, to work with 
um, a lot of different um, drought tolerant plants as well as for the first time plant food um, inside a prison in the Central Valley. Tomatoes, onions, we did a salsa garden before the prison closed in March. This is our team of women, part of our class there. And um, more of what that garden looks like today, two and a half years after we planted it. I've been with Insight Garden Program for three years. So you can see some of our tomatoes and thyme and herb gardens there in the raised beds, lemon verbena, lemon balm. A lot of these plants offer, I think, aromatherapy and just that sensory support to people who are incarcerated and um, in prisons, as Stephen will talk about, uh, trees are not allowed. So having plants, having something green growing is really a beautiful thing. Um, the women's prison, we created a lavender labyrinth. The women thought of this idea um, to bring in women who are hospice in prison. And it's an ADA accessible labyrinth where wheelchairs can come in. They can smell and sense the lavender as it grows. And women who are dying in prison of cancer, or different illnesses can have a chance to come and receive some healing um, before, um, before they pass on. And some of the women serve as chaplains to one another inside the prison actually, when some of them are in our program. So really a beautiful idea of serving one another um, in a very vulnerable um, place and way. Some other, oh, let's see if I can go back. A couple of other uh, pictures with our um, walking path. Those tree rounds actually came from my dad's uh, land in Mariposa that were killed by climate change induced uh, drought. The, the bark beetle um, ate up these pine trees, ponderosa pines on the land in the mountains where my dad lives, but he was able to cut them into wood rounds and brought them into prison. So some of the ways that, uh, that we can repurpose some of these losses for good. Um, and our picture of some of the women who created the Lavender Labyrinth in our latest class inside prison, including Angelica on this call. Um, many of the women, I should say, um, are in prison partly because of trauma and experiences that brought them there. Um, so a lot of what our program does in the women's prison is addresses some of the trauma um, that led up to their crimes. So some of the impacts that I see of our program really quick are, um, I think, creating a different model, like I shared, a more restorative model for healing within a very punitive system that's more retribution focused. Um, working with inner growth that ripples out um, beyond those inside to their families and communities as they do their own healing work that has impacts um, beyond. And then the environmental impact um, through our gardening and environmental education, we see growth in eco-literacy and understanding how ecosystems work, how we're part of ecosystems and engagement in environmental justice. Many of the people in prison come from communities impacted by environmental justice, toxic waste, racism, um, you know, disproportionate um, numbers of people who are incarcerated are, um, poor and as well as uh, people of color. And so um, really looking at cultivating leadership from within for when they're released and um, creating change on the outside. And then finally, the systemic impact. I think our reentry work is really helping to reduce those cycles of incarceration and foster community safety as we reconnect people. Um, they really have very little support when they come out from the state. And so really trying to fill in those gaps with other community-based organizations to provide successful bridges with their home community. Um, and then, like I said, developing their leadership potential. So now we're gonna focus a little bit more on Stephen. This is um, Stephen on the inside working with our sunflowers. And on the outside, isn't that a better picture? <laughs> Freedom. Um, we took a trip to Sequoia National Park recently that I'll invite Stephen to share a little bit about as part of our reentry work. We try to bridge people's connections with nature on the outside as well as inside prisons. So we've been doing more hikes, especially now during COVID when it's safer to be outside, um, as well as some time spent with other people in reentry like Alvaro and Stephen pictured here. Um, at a river recently to, uh, to just enjoy ourselves and be able to be in the natural world and, 
and celebrate freedom together. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Stephen. I would like to say that there was a lot of meaningful things about the program. Um, most importantly, just uh, seeing the people that come in to uh, volunteer and to uh, show us a new perspective on life. Um, that was very meaningful. That was one of the most meaningful things. And not only that, but to see like trailblazers like um, Arnold Trevino come in, you know, um, just got his master's degree. And it's just a great example for, you know, guys like us that are in there trying to change their lives um, and are looking for an example, you know, someone to look up to or someone who's done it before rather than just, you know, kind of just go off the negative, you know, the negative examples and, you know, the negative, uh, um, I don't know, stereotypes that you, that, you know, mostly people are used to because, uh, you know, being released from prison, there's like, you know, there's always that stigma of just, you know, you're just going to, well, at least, I mean, out here in California, there, there is kind of a, the, the understanding that, you know, most of us are just going to be returning uh, very soon back to prison. Um, you know, they set up pretty much uh, a, a pretty, pretty bad uh, um, prison, prison, prison system. I mean, there's like, I mean, almost like 44 prisons out here and uh, and they're just barely getting into rehabilitation. So which is really a good thing. And to see you guys to come in, it was really it was really inspiring and it was really meaningful, not only to me, but most of us in the program and uh, including Alvaro, uh, hoping to see you soon um, out here and, um, you know, trade trade notes and touch base about a lot of our experiences now that we're out and applying a lot of the things that we learned in the, in this class, um, in this program, um, especially the returning back to our communities and becoming, you know, people of change and, um, you know, just breaking the barriers um, of a lot of the, just a lot of the stereotypes and a lot of the, just the negative old beliefs and attitudes that we used to have and those that are put upon us, you know, by the society that we're in, but, um, there's so many meaningful things that I could just go on and on, but uh, those are just a few just to touch off right now. Reconnecting with nature is, it's, it's, you know, it's really, it's, it's a relief, you know, um, cause you know, in there, there's just such a lack of any kind, any type of naturalness. Um, you know, most of it, for example, you know, um, as you know, if you just look into a prison, Google it, I mean, it's just concrete, razor wire, you know, uh, bad environment, uh, but um, just reconnecting in there through the garden and um, just getting that feeling, you know, feeling the soil in your hands or just, uh, you know, planting seed or, or uh, nurturing the plant uh, through its stages, um, it kind of reconnects you, you know, with the natural world. And then when you step out and, you know, you're finally out here, a lot of the things that we actually take for granted, um, you know, you don't really take them for granted anymore. Like, for instance, um, when we went to Sequoia National uh, Park, I mean, there was just like a lot of stuff. There's a, there's a lot of things, of course, the trees, you know, uh, the animals, uh, even the soil. But even as we jokingly uh, made reference to was rocks, but I was looking at the rocks, they were like granite. And, you know, there's different types of things, you know, you, if you just, you know, take the time, which we all have to absorb the beauty and nature that's around us, um, you know, we become more appreciative of it. And, Something that I'm most proud of um, since being out, there are a lot of accomplishments that I've done that I'm doing so far. But I would say, for one, would be my reconnection with my faith, uh, uh, strengthening in that, and um, you know, just being able to probably communicate with more people naturally and and not in the manner of which I used to talk. Like just in prison, I used to just it used to be very difficult, um, you know, just talking to what I would consider normal people, people that are out here in the community, you know, no, just regular people. Now I feel, I feel proud of the fact that I can actually go out, you know, have a natural, meaningful conversation with somebody and no longer live in any type of fear, you know. But with that, I would just have to give thanks to, um, to my beliefs, you know, to my faith and the strength that it's giving me to carry on out here and to accomplish all these small accomplishments that I'm doing. But um, I would say that would just be my main, 
the main thing that I'm proud of is that. But um, there are lots of there there are lots of uh, meaningful things out here. Oh, I mean, um, there are lots of things out here that 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 we do take for granted. And um, coming out here to the program, I mean, um, I just show appreciation every day for all the little things that I've had that 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 I've had taken from me since uh, being incarcerated since. I was a juvenile and um, everything, just being able to, uh, you know, manage my own time the way I want to manage it, to uh, have a job, um, being able to earn a living, um, being able to drive, being able to have air, being able to look at nature. Um, in fact, the job I work at, I work outside for a majority of the day. And, you know, a lot of times I take in my surroundings. Um, there's a lake. Um, there's reeds, there's ducks, cranes, uh, jackrabbits, squirrels, there's all types of animals that are out there. And it's just every day, you know, I thank God that I have a job and I'm outside and I'm somewhere where I'm not taking for granted. You know, I'm just, I'm outside and I'm enjoying the beauty of it. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, it's always beautiful to hear you share your connections with your faith and the ways that that's grown since being incarcerated and you know since we are on a call with eco stewards which is a faith-based group and some of them may connect with those themes i was wondering if you can just share a little bit more about your faith and you know what that's how that's been part of your transformation and then also if there's any connections for you like you were just sharing with the natural world of how does your how does your relationship with your higher power with your creator connect you um, with creation and the and the natural world well, I would say that um, being able to see uh, God's beauty, um, you know, the things that He created, it just makes me feel that, you know, um, some something, it, it was created. It, it can't, it can't be, like, by accident or, you know, it had to be some type of design, you know, um, you know, like I shared with you, Kat, um, you know, I'm still, I'm still in the beginning of my faith, you know, I've just, I've, my relationship was pretty much non-existent until I got out and just recently just being able to come into it and, you know, taking it in little by little, it's uh, helping me out here. But, um, as far as with the natural world, um, you know, I just feel that when I see these things, it's like some, some, somebody, something created it. And, um, I just have to be appreciative of it, you know? Awesome. Thanks, Stephen. I thought maybe I'd share a little bit too. You know, I'm a person of faith and um, Insight Garden program is not necessarily a faith-based group. So I speak personally here from my own, from my own perspectives, but um, I just wanted to share just some of the connections that I've been thinking about between like mass incarceration and these systems that, um, that I've witnessed and that Stephen's experienced physically, uh, mentally, spiritually, um, and, and the, the um, environmental injustices of our time that seem to just be growing with climate change. Um, it seems to me that, that, you know, that it's almost the same mentality or logic behind what's driving climate change and what's driving this like prison system that we see. Um, I've, I've um, become more aware of the ways that our economy keeps creating these sacrifice zones which is kind of this, this uh, language that I found really helpful around places of waste. So where do we dump our waste? And most often wa waste is dumped um, in communities that are mo the most vulnerable. Poor communities um, or people of color experience more toxic waste um, or these sacrifice zones. So if, if you're um, interested in participating, I, I welcome you to put what are some examples of sacrifice zones that you see in your community when it comes to environmental injustice? And you can type those in the chat if you want, because I don't, you know, want to take up too much time um, brainstorming these. But you know, just a couple examples in my area are like these cesspools created by the concentrated animal feeding operations, like the um, cattle or pigs. There are waste pools that that create methane in the Central Valley and pollution. Um, at Avenal State Prison, it was actually built on top of a toxic waste or on top of a landfill, a waste dump. Um, so literally, like the connection between environmental injustice and mass incarceration, these prisons 
sometimes or oftentimes are built uh, nearby or on top of um, where we dump our waste. And I think where we put what society sees as like human waste or people that we have no use for in society get put or funneled into people who are more disposable, um, perhaps get funneled into the prison system, many of whom come from communities that are impacted by environmental injustices. Um, and, you know, the prisons themselves are often sites of environmental injustice, like at the women's prison, um, or at many of the prisons, there's no cooling systems beyond fans um, in areas where climate change is just growing and, and summers are getting hotter and hotter is one example. Um, or they're very near the almond orchards here where there's a lot of pollution um, and pesticide drift sometimes um, in the Central Valley from agriculture. Um, or food justice issues could be part of that, like the food quality in prison. So I say all these things because I think that, um, that these systems of waste that we create are very connected between like the waste that impacts Mother Earth and the waste that, um, how we treat prison. Um, one of the people in prison that is, um, one of the things that we've heard over and over in our program is, um, thank you for treating us like we're human. And that just seems so basic to me, you know, like that people would have to say thank you for treating us like we're human. But I think it shows the ways that people are dehumanized in these um, systems that are part of. So I'm seeing people put in here a couple waste sites or, or sacrifice zones in their own communities. Thanks for doing that. Um, so I think I, I guess I wanted to call us before we open it up for Q&A um, towards a justice system and a um, and environmental systems that are actually healing. Because um, I think that we have more imagination than the current system as it is. You know, that uh, the current system is based more on retribution and a kind of justice that punishes people for the harms that they've caused and separates them from their community, rather than really creating opportunities for restoration and for making amends. Um, and to bring in a little bit of, you know, my own, um, my own theology, I believe that uh, when it comes to God, that God's justice is actually not a punitive kind of justice, that, that God is bringing restorative justice and liberating justice. Um, and we see that through Jesus and how he goes about in stories and scripture, creating communities, uh, communities of sinners and outcasts, of people who are cast away from society, but find a home and belonging um, in, their, in their relationship with Jesus and that community of forgiveness and a community of enemy love. Um, you know, Jesus announces Jubilee as central to his mission, which is debt relief and land return, um, release for captives, for those in prison. Um, and so I, I really feel like um, that at the heart of God's longing and that I feel inside myself too is just this kingdom um, of God. So rather than, or I guess you could say the kingdom of God as is announced in scripture could also be called a kingdom or a relation way of relating with God and with creation where everyone belongs, um, where those who are least at the very bottom are treated as the greatest. Um, we see Jesus identifying with the least and even becoming a prisoner of the state that Jesus actually faced the death penalty in his time, you know? And through his death, he suffered under that retributive mindset, that retributive justice on the cross. But God's restorative love in the end was greater in the story of the resurrection um, that we see liberation from, from that death system. So, um, so I feel like our calling is to really be restored in right relationship and be part of that restoration dream that God has for right relationship with each other and with the earth. Um, so for me, the, this kind of faith um, that compels me to this work um, is, comes out of this relationship with this restorative God um, who calls me to go into these sacrifice zones and to say that we don't need sacrifice of the earth or other people, the most vulnerable in order to survive. And that there are actually other ways of living like permaculture teaches us where there's enough for all to be fed and satisfied um, that there are ways of practicing justice and healing that don't require retribution. Um, so 
I think Insight Garden Program is teaching me and showing me that we can actually build these systems of restorative justice and healing that can still help keep our communities safe without relying on mass incarceration. Um, and there's lots of models out there that we could point to of lots of other organizations are, who are doing amazing work like this. I'm wondering, does everyone have access to the gardens in prison? Is there some kind of prerequisite or is there some kind of um, something that you have to achieve in order to get into the, in, into the Insight Garden program? I'll let you answer that one, Stephen. Uh, I would say that, you know, um, there's an assignment officer or office rather, and um, you just pretty much, you sign up for it and there's a long waiting list because there's only assigned seating for so many uh, uh, inmates at a time. And um, being that the Inside Garden program is a year long program, uh, the seats are usually, uh, usually occupied for up to a year, but sometimes um, there'll be transfers or you know, people will move or people will just lose interest. And in that case, a uh, seat will open up and then the next uh, person on the list will be assigned. But for the most part, um, there's no real requirement, just the, the willingness to be in the program, pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And I think that our, our waiting list speaks to how much we need more programs like this. Cause I think at Avenal last time I checked, we had 130 people on the waiting list to get into a program that only is for 25 people each year. So it's clear that like the need and the longing is out there to get your hands in the soil and to learn these skills. Um, at Avenal, unfortunately, the garden is caged off from the rest of the prison. We have to be let in by, um, by correctional officers, by the guards into the garden, but at the women's facility, the garden's actually open and we've been advocating for access and I think are having some success with women being allowed into the garden to walk around kind of like a park without picking things who aren't in our program. And it's a very meditative space and they've actually been using it for some ceremonies like a woman, a woman recently got her sentence commuted and um, was released. And so they had kind of a celebration ceremony for her in the garden and she wasn't part of our program. So I'd love to see more of that, um, of the garden being used for that. Mm -hmm. What are some of the costs to run a program like IGP and how can it be implemented in other prisons? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, so I'd have to look up some of our you know, grants budgets, but um, it really, um, oh, I think that hmm, starting costs might run around like 70,000 a year and that's just a big you know estimate right now um, for the program and each we get we've we've received some grants through the um, CDCR the California Department of Corrections um, and Rehabilitation because they're seeing that they need more of a restorative and rehabilitation focus and aren't always able to offer that themselves so they have these grant cycles for outside groups to run programs and we'd like to get continual funding because right now we're only we're less than one percent of the CDCR's budget is for programs like ours, and so we're really trying to advocate through the um, there's a working group of of community based organizations transformative prisons working group working at trying to get more funding for this, and that's really how this program can be implemented more broadly I think, um, but the program you know it, it is in prisons outside of the state and oftentimes. Those prison and their social workers have reached out to Insight Garden Program to ask uh, for training and to come in and start a program there. Um, if you're interested in talking nitty gritty, I can share my email address and direct you to our, our executive directors right now, and they can share more about how to get things launched since I haven't been part of the, the launching side of programs. Stephen and Katarina, I really appreciate both of your conversation around all of this, your insight, uh, pun intended, but really um, a question I, I heard, uh, I think it was you, Katarina, but I, but I heard it started with, uh, with you, Stephen, um, not taking things for granted um, was powerful in the appreciation um, aspect. And then you mentioned that people involved in the garden have, um, have like been able to lower their boundaries about getting together around maybe race and about, around other things. Could you speak more about that as to why you have seen that 
to be happening because I wonder if there's some keys for the rest of us around getting together and, and coming together. I, could you, either of you, maybe both, both speak to that? I might tap Stephen for that question. What do you think about working in the garden and, you know, people's masks or their guard coming down, Stephen? Um, I will definitely have to say that um, not only because of the curriculum uh, involved in the class, but just, just a lot of the other things too, like the meditations in the beginning, uh, you know, we all share what we're, sometimes what we're feeling or just what our thoughts are. So just right off, right from the beginning where we even just be pleasant, you know, uh, at first, like when I was in the class, uh, my first couple of days, I was kind of guarded. I was like, I didn't know what to expect. But uh, I see that, you know, you guys come in with pure energy. It's really positive and it, and it just, it's, it's actually really, um, it's really, I, I, I'm not a loss for words, but I mean, your positive energy, like we just, we just grab it, you know? And, um, you know, we say, we're saying hello, good morning to everybody. And we're in the garden. It's just a nice place to be. We're not in the housing blocks or anything like that. And um, there's even people that we see, you know, in the facility that sometimes we don't talk to, but being that we're in a class, now we have some kind of mutual ground, some common ground, you know? And um, then we start sharing about stuff and how we're feeling, what we're thinking. And sometimes opening up is difficult at first, but once you see someone open up and you hear them share something that you never thought that they would say or think, you know, or even, you yourself saying or sharing something that they probably never thought you would say or think, you know, it kind of changes a person's instant judgment on you or perspective of you and uh, be it either race or uh, religion or whatever it may be. Um, just, just that environment, just the program itself. It, 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 it is very, um, it's, it's, it's conductive to just breaking the boundaries. And um, you guys are really good at, uh, you know, breaking people out of their, their, um, their shells, you know, and um, I mean, it's, it's really, there's a lot of energy there. Thanks, Stephen. I'm wondering, Arnold Trevino, as somebody who's seen this program in prisons and helped facilitate and also been incarcerated at some higher level prisons too, what's your perspective on that question? Because I think that's a really good question. Like, what is it about Insight Garden Program or these kinds of programs that helps people to create community and to kind of get outside of these uh, masks or shells. So, uh, and we've heard that quite a few times that, that we make them feel human. Uh, being in there for 25 years, I, I know exactly what they're talking about. Uh, and just a simple, and Stephen, you can go ahead and chime in on this. Uh, well, before I even say my part, what, 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 what makes you feel that uh, we treat you guys as humans? Mm. Well, for one, you know, um, like I said, we, we come in, you know, to the garden, they unlock the gate, we go in for the program, and right, right off the bat, you know, you guys are shaking our hands. This is before COVID and all that, of course, but you guys are sh uh, shaking hands and greeting us, you know, good mornings, uh, just acting natural. I mean, it's to us in there, you know, being a person that's, you know, you know, uh, sometimes you don't get that from people unless you really know them, you know, and um like I said, uh, um, coming out here and being able to get that out of my mentality, get that 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 feeling of like you know that I'm less than other people or living in that fear, you know, um, the program was actually very helpful in that. You know, um, you know, there's people that like I said, my first day I, I went and I was kind of guarded. I didn't know, but right off 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 the top, you guys were really nice, uh, sharing and talking and uh, trying to connect with us. And the garden is, was helpful to that. And, um, you know, that's just one of the things that would make us feel human. And, you know, it's, it's almost embarrassing to talk about it, but really though, it's the truth. You know, um, sometimes we don't get that uh, interaction with people in there, you know, um, cause it's either your garden and a prisoner, that's it. You know, you talk to your fellow prisoners and I mean, you might have a small chat with a guard, but I mean, it's nothing, it's nothing as, warm or welcome as what you guys were offered. When you guys would come in with the program, every Saturday morning, we would go and we would come in, you know, feeling good and we would leave a little sad, you know, but um, it was, 
it was like, dang, you know, it's like, and the things that we would share and the things that we would talk about in there, I mean, we were like not even in there, you know, we weren't, we were, we were like at home or in our garden, our own garden, you know, and you know, we, some of that stuff we planted and um, just being able to talk with people and their ideas, their beliefs and values that they, that they hold. I mean, that's something that a conversation that normally wouldn't be brought up on a prison yard, you know, it's, unless you were really close to a person, but for the most part, um, those topics of conversation really don't come up, you know, let alone with, uh, with an officer. So, um, I mean, those things like that just make us feel like there was a connection. There was a, a, a passion to connect, you know, to someone like us. And it, and it, and it, like I said, we all, we're all grateful for it, you know, and, um, it gave us, it gave us, you know, uh, 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 want, you know, of something better than what we had there, you know, because, you know, there are some of us that were, how should I say, uh, content with the lifestyle that we were living there. But then, you know, come to a program like that, we would go through it and we'd go, you know what, there's more to life than just this, you know, the natural world, you know, the, the family bonding, your community, you know, things like that. And there, I mean, there's just so much, you know, um, I mean, in the beginning of this whole chat, I was a little bit, I'm a little, I'm a little tired from work, you know, but, you know, seeing Arnold now, I'm able to jog some stuff out, you know, and just remember stuff. But, um, yeah, um, those are just a couple of things that made us feel human. A simple act of kindness, just a simple handshake. I mean, it means the world to us uh, when we're in there. I, I remember those days. You don't get a handshake from uh, free staff. Uh, COs, you're never going to get a handshake from them. Uh, but the priests have to come in. Uh, it, it just, it means a lot. Just something that simple can make you feel that much human. Could you share about, I, I love how you tell the story about what the hummingbirds and the butterflies do to guys inside. <laughs> yeah, so so we have the garden and, and you know, it, and it's a transformational program, so it is. And as, and a lot of these guys are all tatted up in the face and they're all yoked up and, you know, really intimidating looking uh, like me, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these guys so they walk by the garden and they'll see some of our pollinators you know the, the bees or, or, or a hummingbird and for that split second they, they'll take that mask off that hardcore mask and then they get all giddy they get all the kid comes out of them like oh look at a hummingbird and and just for that split second if i can have a camera and, and capture that it's totally priceless but then they regain their composure and they look around and put that mask back on and you know, and then they keep on going, but it is so, I mean, the beauty of what a garden can do, and everybody's connected to it. We have a lesson where we talk about gardening, uh, think back in our past and see where we're connected to gardening, and everybody, doesn't matter what walks of life you came from, your background, everybody's connected to the garden. They'll talk about, oh, my dad, oh, my grandmother, oh, my, somebody in the family, they're all connected to the gardening. We're all connected to gardening somehow, one way or another, in nature, and bringing it back to the forefront is really the, the the connector with all the participants that we have. Uh, we have some that are from the U.S., some that are not from the U.S., and but everybody's connected to gardening, uh, which is really a, a beauty. We have a, a Inside Garden Program volunteer and board member on the call as well. So, yeah, and she's just drawing out how Beth Waitkus, our founder, really created um, Inside Garden Program after 9-11 happened. And, um, she was in New York at the time and was just really devastated. So her, her kind of impulse of starting this program was to reconnect with a shared humanity. And by going into prisons to do that felt like a way that she could bring her love of gardening together with this idea of um, restoration around humanity. So, so thanks, Devin, for bringing that up. That's a great connector with these themes of, of how we um, reconnect with ourselves as humans through connection with Earth one another so for my mom she's asking can we share about arnold's work with project rebound which i think is another great example of transformational work being done um, with folks who are formerly incarcerated arnold do you want to give your elevator speech <laughs> so i did for 1986 until 2011 i did my time i pro in 2011 i new challenges uh, different world uh, in 2012 i returned back to school and uh, from 2012 until 2019, I did graduate, get my master's degree. Uh, and in that process, I was introduced, I helped launch the Project Rebound program at Fresno State University, 
uh, that started back in the 60s at San Francisco State University, and it finally expanded 50 years later into, it was offered to the other 23 US uh, CSUs, and eight of us took up the challenge. So in 2016, I was the first intern, and I helped build it from the ground. Uh, Project Rebound is a student support service program at the universities. Uh, we help people who have been formerly incarcerated who are now interested in higher, higher education. We help through mentorship, tutoring, uh, some financial perks uh, for the matriculated students. Uh, we're there I mean, every step of the way from, from GED to PhD, doesn't matter where you're at. If you're interested in higher education or education period, uh, from referrals to actual tutoring on campus, we're there for you. And we have a pretty high graduation rate. I think we're at, uh, since the 60s to now, like 80% graduation rate. Uh, recidivism rate has been at uh, 3% for anybody that has stepped foot into Project Rebound. Uh, we don't like our, uh, we don't like each other to, to fail. And when we feel like we can't go on, where there's somebody always gonna be there, either somebody's pulling you, somebody's pushing you, but we help each other out, get across that finish line. So here recently, I was the first intern, I got hired on for two more years as student assistant, and then finally I got hired on full-time as an outreach coordinator. I started in January. Uh, so from being a lifer to having a real job, not uh, out there working the fields uh, and scrubbing toilets and flipping burgers, but I have a real job, a state job. Uh, I'm getting to that point where I, now I can afford to literally afford to buy my own three bedroom with a swimming pool and a truck and uh, I'm renting a room right now, but I'm saving up and, and um, life is good when you make that change. Uh, education, with education, nothing is impossible. Can I just invite us into whatever spirit uh, moment of, of, of silence of shared uh, collectiveness? Uh, I just want to sh share this blessing uh, for, uh, for, for what we've heard and our intentions. So, For hummingbirds, for lavender that grows in the midst of paths now well worn by sacred souls, O oh, Creator, we give you thanks. We ask your blessings on those confined yet made in your image, for those redefined and expanding and creating new programs and spaces for others, for all of nature and creation. Uh, may there be blessing and may all of us uh, inspired in a new way this night, this afternoon, uh, fill the spaces um, with deeper humility and gratitude for every breath of air that comes as a gift. We pray in whatever name is sacred to each of us, to me that is love, to me that is Christ. Amen. Thank you, friends. Go in peace. <laughs>